Okay, I can't do this anymore. I got to come clean with you. You know what? You've been getting ripped off. So for the past year or more, you've only been seeing a part of soda. I haven't showed you the whole thing. I feel like you're kind of getting ripped off by me, maybe some of the other bloggers too. Hey, look, we're showing you maybe the most glamorous, maybe the most interesting part. Hiking, great views, um, getting on the radio, making contacts all over the world. But uh, you've been getting cheated out of how do we plan this stuff? So what is it? So I've decided to start a new series called Soda 360. I'm really excited to get this thing going because what I'll do is I'll go a little bit of an intro. What the heck is soda? Why do we do it, etc. Talk a little bit about prominence, what makes a soda peak. Some of the things that you've been missing on all these other videos, which is, you know, maybe like any other traveling video. So we'll talk specifically about summits on the air and ham radio in this episode. In these episodes, actually. So we'll start off with a couple of uh, videos on planning, intro and planning. Uh, then we'll talk about how to get there. That's not too hard. We got GPS, charts, and some other things. Um, we'll go through the setup of my station and how I do it. Uh, spotting, how I do that. What the heck is spotting? Why do it? And then maybe activate a peak. Definitely activate a peak. Um, we'll use sideband. Hopefully uh, some CW. We'll chase some other guys on summits. And uh, so we'll do that. Pack it all up. Certainly want to get home safely. And then at the end, there's a little bit of paperwork to be done. How do we finish this thing off? So we'll talk a little bit about how I get the, my logs my, from my logging program uploaded to the SOTA website to get my points. Um, I downloaded it onto my computer and some other things. So we'll go over all those things. It's kind of more of a 360 look at SOTA rather than just that one little picture. So let's get started. CQ, CQ, CQ. This is November 1, Charlie Lima, Charlie. Summit's on the air. Yeah. What the heck is soda? So let's hit that. Summits, it's soda is Summits on the Air, S-O-T-A, is an award scheme for radio amateurs and shortwave, eh, blah, 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 blah. You can read this. This is what's off the soda website. Here's my take on it. It's geocaching for radio geeks. You pick a designated mountain, you take your ham radio up there, and as an activator, as an activator, you take a ham radio up there, you get up there any way you can, drive, walk, climb, free solo, whatever it is, get your four contacts, log them, and you're done. As a chaser in soda, you're trying to get a hold of guys that are on mountaintops. That's typically uh, what a lot of guys do that can't get out of their house in the winter when it's snowing like crazy. Uh, so they'll sit in their ham shack and try to make contacts with people like me. That's what soda is. Okay, now you know what soda is. Let's go out the side and talk about why we should do soda. Okay, uh, why do soda? All right, well, let's talk about that. There's two uh, things you can be, an activator. Those are the guys that go up on top of a mountaintop that we're doing right now. Um, get four contacts um, with our portable station and then uh, and log our points. So that's what an activator does. Um, you can get up here multiple ways and we'll talk about that more. Um, as a chaser, that's also part of soda. That's kind of the yin-yang thing. So the chaser out there, uh, well, Gary and Martha out in Kansas, those guys are awesome chasers. They uh, see me pop up on the soda website on a, on a peak and uh, <laughs> Gary's on top of it. He's not my first, he's my second contact. So um, let's talk a little bit about as, as an activator. Um, it's low RF noise up here. I mean really low, like one or less most of the time. If you're on a peak over Black Mountain, it's really tough because sometimes the noise levels I've seen as high as nine at some peaks uh, because of that. The camera's moving because I don't have a cameraman or woman. Uh, so a little breezy up here, but not bad today. Uh, the second one is just joy of getting outside, getting some fresh air like today is absolutely fantastic. And the views are awesome. Uh, partly cloudy skies and we can see all the way to the ocean. Um, it's sometimes a challenge and a sense of accomplishment, you know, Getting to some of these peaks is a, a bit tough. Um, so it is a real sense of accomplishment getting up there, getting your radio contacts and getting home safely. Uh, uh, there have been some difficult ones. Today's is really easy. There are some that you can do a drive up to. So 
Um, it, it's, it's perfect for practicing emergency communications, like uh, for Aries, for example, where you have to go up, set up a, a portable station, get on the air, and uh, start supporting some, uh, some agency or local group. Um, the other thing I love doing from up here is chasing. So I can actually be a chaser and an activator at the same time. So what I can do is I can chase guys that are on other summits from up here. That's actually one of the, I really enjoy doing that. I can't explain why, but uh, it's a lot of fun to me. Probably because I know there's some other ham on another mountaintop, um, maybe even suffered a lot more than I did to get up there and get his contacts. He's having a great time and I kind of know what his environment's like. Um, so, and then I'll have to say it again. Wow, what a view. Um, you know, I enjoy hiking. It gives me a reason to get out on, get outside, get to the top of a mountain. There's a lot of mountains I would have never thought to go to. There's some mountains I'll probably never go back to. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, it gets me outside. Um, it's a great way to explore new areas. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I do ham radio. It's a lot of fun. Um, Chaser, let's talk about Chaser. A chaser can be, like I said before, can be me up on a mountaintop or another fella chasing me uh, from his mountaintop. Or it can be Gary and Martha down in the radio shack. So sometimes you can't get outdoors because of the weather. It's, it's freezing cold and snow. Um, maybe you're up in uh, Vancouver or something and you're just freezing your butt off. So you get out there and chase guys like me. You can live vicariously through our adventures, right? Um, it's easy to get contact. So this is really important because um, if you're just starting out and you're a little bit shy, and you don't want to get caught in some big, uh, a long conversation, you don't know what to say, um, so it is easy. You just reach out, you know where the guy is, you know what frequency he is, he is at or she is at, and uh, then you give him a ring. You give him a call on that frequency if you can hear him. Uh, wait your turn. Um, when he gets a space open, shout out your call sign. If he, gives you a call, if he gives your call sign back, you're in. You just made a contact. He will want or she will want your uh, uh, the, their signal report and then they'll give you a signal report and that's typically all that happens you can talk a little bit more but uh, um, it can be a really short exchange and a little bit low risk if you're learning CW like I am when I was starting out um, I chased because I knew all I needed to be able to send was my call sign and hear my call sign and just decode a few things coming in via CW fast enough and um, that was really great. It was a low risk way for me to get on the air with CW and uh, get some contacts and get experience uh, using the keyer and making real contacts with guys. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun and still is a lot of fun. So um, the exchange is always quick and easy if you want. And uh, sometimes there's a, a challenge of either uh, pulling out that QRP station that's out on a mountaintop and only has five watts or, or she's only running 10 watts or something. Um, so that's be a real challenge for uh, your station um, to try to pull that contact out. And it may be a contact in New Zealand, uh, Japan. I've, uh, I've made some of the summits with guys in Japan um, at the time I was running 100 watts. So it went really well. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. So, and uh, the other part about being up here is you get to share it with uh, other hikers and stuff. So that's why I do soda. All right. With the intro complete, it's time to move on to planning. I call it planning like a pilot because I approach planning kind of like I did when I was flying. But really, it's not any different than going to a restaurant. First, you have to pick a restaurant. Then you're going to look at the traffic conditions, weather, etc. Um, I don't know you may. Uh, we'll talk about what to bring. Uh, choosing a hiking path, that is, how do we get there? And, uh, of course, how do we get to the trailhead? So... Uh, let's get started. Okay, step one in my planning process is choose a summit. Where in the heck are you going to go? Um, there's two tools that I'm going to show you um, that I use. Uh, the first one is sodamaps.org. I started using that uh, when I was uh, started the hobby back in 2017 and still use it today. Um, it's sodamaps.org. This is a bit clunky, but it has a lot of cool features in it, and I've used it a lot. Um, I'm going to show you some downsides to it, but uh, it's not it's not too difficult to use. The first way to use this thing is to just choose an association that is kind of like a state level, although you'll see some overlaps. I'm going to choose California, uh, since that's where I live. I'll also show you some examples of Arizona. 
Um, so let's go into W6. And uh, what's interesting is you have to know this is mainly California. They don't put it on there. You'll notice a lot of the other ones, uh, they have the state on there. So I don't quite understand that. Um, I'm sure there's some people out there. You can put it in the comments if you do. Um, so the next thing you need to do is choose a region. Now I'm going to choose just one right now to show you. But uh, this is showing you all the regions. I'm going to zo zoom in a little bit here. Uh, to show you those, you can zoom in and out, and if you have a mouse like mine, it's going to be kind of wonky. So I'm down here in Southern California. There are several that I could use down here, but I'm going to choose Southern Southern Desert. So let's do that. SD, and that is going to bring up all the summits in the Southern Desert. Now this actually overlaps with another one um, that I'll show you in a minute. So you'll actually, wh where they overlap, if you're only looking at this, you may miss some summits. That's kind of the problem with this thing. But there's a couple of things you can do about that. You can choose multiple sum, uh, multiple regions. So example, um, oof, I think this one and this one, there's a little bit of overlap. So let's try it, see if I got right. Yeah. So you can see there's a little bit of overlap on these two um, right there. So see how this, uh, region overlaps with the other one. You'll have some some uh, uh, summits that look like they're in the southern desert, but they're not. You have to have them both to see kind of this whole area. Um, so I'm going to turn that one off just to declutter it a little bit to just show you a few features here. Um, so we're going to stick with uh, that one. Southern coastal ranges, which I think will get to the one that I want to see. Um, so I'm going to just pick one of these. Uh, here's one by my house. It's uh, by, uh, called Black Mountain. There's, By the way, there's a few Black Mountains. The numbers on these little guys tell you how many points it is. And um, the summit designator for this one is uh, Whiskey 6 slash SC338. So let's zoom in a little, just a little bit more on that. You can see it's on Black Mountain. They give you a little bit of a topo map. And you say, well, you just want to know a little bit more about that. So you can click on it. Um, it'll bring up this little box. And it gives you a little bit more info. Um, the latitude and longitude, which uh, this comes really handy because you'll paste this into a charting program of your choice. Mine happens to be all trails. And I'll show you how I do that a little bit later. Um, it gives you some other data. Um, but let's drill down a little bit. I can see that W6, WD6TED was the last person to activate this. So um, I think the other thing that's really important uh, when you're doing your research is how many times has this thing been activated? So if it's been activated zero times, you'll see a little uh, the, the summit designator in a red box. This is important because um, unless you're really into bushwhacking and some some difficult hikes. Um, if it's zero, that may be for a reason. Um, so it's your first indicator of difficulty, in my opinion. Um, I use this quite a bit when I'm looking at some rugged areas, and if it's never been activated, then hmm, I start looking a little bit closely, look for trails, etc. Um, look on all trails and see if there's some published trails and other people have done it. Then it's like, okay, if there's trails to it, then hey, this is cool. I'll be able to get, I'll get the first activator for it. Um, I'll certainly look a bit deeper and, and we'll talk about this more in depth about how I plan an attack to a summit. And uh, so a little bit more research. But again, that's just about the number of activations. Uh, this one's been activated 43 times. So I'm guessing this is really easy to get to. And uh, it just so happens that it is. There's a road that goes all the way to the top. Um, you can't drive up there. But it's a very pleasant walk. Um, you can take your uh, your favorite pet, um, and uh, also if your uh, your girlfriend, wife, uh, significant other um, likes to go out and hike, this is a good one to do. It's not too far, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, just go out. You can look at the published trails. We'll do that. One other thing we're going to do is we're going to click on that little title thing there, and that's going to bring us to the details page of this baby. Um, gives you a few more details. Um, if there are any uh, uh, comments, etc., been published about this, 
you'll see them listed here. Um, I don't typically do that because I do publish a blog. Uh, sometimes I'll put something up here if it's a real bear to get to. Um, I'll put a link to my blog. Um, you can see the latest activators. Um, this is really important, so let me just point this out here, the, the latest and uh, some of the other activations. So you can see my uh, call sign on here, November 1, Charlie Lima, Charlie. The reason why this is important is if you're having a hard time trying to figure out how you're going to get from you know, wherever you're going to park your car to the summit, try emailing any of the folks on this list. If you see somebody um, on here multiple times, um, then it, that's probably the person you want to contact because uh, he or she knows how to get up there and uh, they, they're always willing to help you out. I've done that uh, on a summit that I did uh, near Tucson, Arizona. I didn't see any trails to the peak. Um, the terrain looked, uh, well, it was very interesting terrain in the area. So I just reached out to a, uh, another operator from the Tucson area who had activated it. And, uh, you know, I had a response back within an hour as, uh, that included uh, a description of how to get there, um, what the train was like, and his chart showing the path that he took. I mean, this guy gave me everything that I needed to finish my planning. It was awesome. And uh, I really appreciate that. And I'm always willing to do that. All of my, uh, uh, I record typically at least once when I do a, a summit so you can see exactly how I did it. And, um, you know, I am not a super hiker. If I did that, that particular summit, you can probably do it as well. Um, especially if it's, if, if you had to do a little bit of bushwhacking. Now, I have done some pretty vicious bushwhacks. You probably want to check my blog before you do those. Um, but if you're wondering how to get one, just uh, I'll, I'll show you how to find uh, not only my charts that I've made in all trails, but also my recordings. They're all published publicly, um, and I'm hoping to be able to help out other hikers or soda operators. So that's uh, probably the two biggest things I use here. Um, the other piece is there are some links directly to a Google map. So let's bring up, bring up a Google map of Black Mountain here. And hey, look at that. I've got a um, satellite view of this thing. Zoom out just a little bit. You can see there's a bunch of equipment up there. Hey, it looks like you could just park your car right here and walk on this road all the way to the top. There's also some other trails out here. And uh, this is all uh, visible via satellite. So you can uh, uh, bet your bottom nickel that this is uh, a clear path. And indeed it is. Um, you can switch over to more of a topo map, and this is just using Google Maps, uh, so very, very straightforward. They show the not only the road, but they show some other trails if you want to take those uh, to get to the summit, and here's our summit. Um, again, this is only uh, open to uh, service trucks, etc., that are servicing that, but uh, quite honestly, I enjoy the hike. Um, there's a lot of times where I might have been able to drive to the summit, and I don't mind pulling over and getting out of the car and stretching my legs and feeling the joy of movement. So um, that's the drill down pages. So we'll jump back here, and then I'm going to close this, and uh, we'll go back to uh, the soda map. So that's one way of finding particular summits in your area. Um, as you saw also, um, you can choose multiple by holding the control key down and then clicking a couple of different uh, regions that may be overlapping for you. Um, so that's the first way that you can do that. Okay, there's another way that you can do this. The second way to use this uh, mapping tool is to go to mapping, range mapping. Now this is kind of cool. So let's uh, bring this up and actually a bit more effective as well. So let's define our range. Uh, we want a circle. We want it to be 50, uh, 50 miles in circumference, or not circumference, uh, radius. And we can do from an address, city feature, etc. Um, or if you're at a campsite, 
you can do latitude and longitude. So if you're going camping, uh, you could do this. So let's just do 32 degrees by uh, negative 117. That's kind of in the general area where I'm at right now. And then we'll say map. So what's cool about this is, okay, that points out in the water, but whatever. You get the idea, you get your latitude and longitude, and it's going to show you all of the uh, soda summits in that area. So this is a uh, probably a much better way to find soda summits in an area that you might be operating out of. Might be a campsite, might be your house, uh, friend's house, etc. Um, but uh, this will at least show you those summits. And looks like I'm south of the border here, but you get the idea. All right. The other piece, uh, the other thing that's really handy before I leave this tool is the ability to download all of these summits to a, uh, a file that you can then upload into something like All Trails. So I'll show you an instance of where I've done that a little bit later in the video. The second tool I've started using is Soda Atlas. Now this is really pretty cool. Uh, let me just bring up the about page. Uh, it's SOTL dot AS. And uh, it's been recently published, or at least to me, uh, known by uh, another ham who maintains this. And it's pretty cool because it does several things. So let's take a look at the map uh, that we were just on. And if you remember, we're looking at Black Mountain before, which is uh, pretty near my house. You'll notice something a little bit different. Uh, the number on the summit is not the number of points, but the number of times it's been activated. So if you remember, uh, and we'll click on this one again so you can see, but uh, when you click on it, it brings up a little summary page, and then you can click down for some a little drill down. But uh, you can see, again, uh, the last activator here was... Uh, uh, Whiskey Delta 6 Ted. Um, and if you remember, there were some summits north of me that were zero. Here they are at zero activations. So you can see those right up here. Um, this is pretty handy because, you know what? You don't have to do any choosing of associations and regions and all that goofing around. Just bring up the website. And um, even better if you have your cell phone. You can say zoom in on my location and it'll bring should bring you right up overlay your current location on this chart and allowing you to zoom in and zoom out. So it does work on your, uh, at least on uh, iOS, it does for me. I haven't used a whole lot there, so uh, I'm not going to comment too much on it. Um, but this is probably going to be my go-to in the future. Um, it's pretty cool. It does have some other features on it. Um, click on this one let's see I think I was the last activator on that one possibly that one too yep so um, it has you can go in here to list the summits and search them um, I have found a real use for that but this is really cool because it's one-stop shop I can look at current spots so here are some spots right now uh, looks like up in New Zealand possibly um, since it is evening uh, my time uh, you can get alerts uh, without having to go to Soda Watch, etc., and, and uh, find uh, find other other people who have spotted. So if you have internet access uh, on your phone while you're on a peak, this is one of the ways that you can do it. Um, I use an app on my phone, but this is this is pretty cool. Activators. Um, I'm not sure what this is. Maybe it just allows you to do some uh, searching here. Let's bring up that. Here we go. So activators. I've got 138 uh, peaks that I was successful on. Uh, well, that I got activations on, and uh, number of points, etc. So um, there is that tool, and I would highly recommend that. Again, it gets you into. Um, let's go back to the map. This is the beginning of your research, so or your planning prep. So you found a mountain, you can get additional information about it. Um, I don't see any additional, I'm sure there's some more overlays that you can get on this chart, but uh, this is all about 
at least starting from a point of uh, where you want to go. The other thing you need to get off of here is the latitude and longitude, which I always pull off. And uh, this is pretty handy because you can cut and paste this onto Google Maps and it'll come right up. The other thing you can do is use this waypoint uh, to put it into your charting application, which we're going to talk about uh, here in a minute is how do we pick that hiking path to get there. So there are the two tools um, that I would use. Before I get to rolled into charting, etc., I figured here's what we'll do is we'll look at weather and what to bring. And then on part two of this series, we're going to go over choosing a hiking path, how to chart that in a tool like All Trails, which is what I'm going to use as a reference. And uh, then we'll talk quickly about how I get organized and get ready for the big day so that I can get to the trailhead. So let's move on and talk about weather. Yeah, this is a pretty easy one. There's tons of tools out there that you can use. Um, I like Weather Underground. And uh, what you're looking at right here is Guate, uh, California, which is up by Descanso. It's in Lagunas. And um, there's a little mountain peak there uh, called Guate. And so let's get the weather for that area, see what it's going to be uh, for the next few days. I'm a bit of a, uh, maybe a weather OCD. It comes from my flying, I think. So, uh, hmm, Monday, expect, uh, well, it looks like they're going to have some snow today uh, or later tonight. And uh, Monday, a little bit of rain. So um, I would not recommend doing that when it's raining. Um, typically, A, I don't want to be caught in heavy rains. Um, that's just not my thing. If I'm on the way down, okay, I'm fine with that. I got the weather gear. Um, certainly this tells me if I'm going to go Monday, I better be packing uh, um, uh, s some wet weather gear. And it's going to get cold at night. So if I get stuck up there overnight, it'd probably be a good idea to, to make sure I can survive uh, 33 degrees. So it'd be just about freezing, uh, just a wee bit chilly. So if I get hurt, I'm going to have to wait for uh, some rescue. I uh, just read an article. A uh, guy up in Oregon was out trail running and slipped on some ice and broke his leg. So uh, well, he had a real miserable time. Um, once he did make contact uh, via cell phone, he had to crawl basically to a place where he could use his phone. It took four hours. I think that's a pretty quick. Uh, when you think about it, search and rescue first has to get the guys to come in. Um, a lot of places it's uh, volunteer. Once they get to a staging area, they have to plan their attack. Oh, this is great. You're getting some uh, advertising while we're at it. And then they have to get to you. Uh, and it may take multiple hours just to do that because they need to figure out the safest way to do that. And it may mean that they have to wait. So you're on your own until then. You have to save yourself. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more of that when we get to the safety part of this whole thing. But um, there you go. There's the weather. There's a 10-day weather. Um, if I was going to do this hike, I'd probably let it dry out a couple of days just because I know the terrain. Um, so uh, that gives us kind of the first, first thing to check off on our list. Next up, what to bring. There's a ton of stuff that you can bring, but, uh, well, let's jump right into it. Step three in the planning process is what are you going to bring? Well, it really depends on what you want to do. So it's all plant part of the planning process. What I'm about to run through is the things that I'm carrying and then some comments around options, etc. There are about a million ways to do this hobby and different things you can do. But uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So number one, my number one radio of choice is the Elecraft KX2. This thing absolutely rocks. It is a multi-band, multi-mode radio. Um, with a built-in tuner. Um, highly recommend the built-in tuner. You, um, it allows you to carry NFED uh, uh, antennas that um, require tuning and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, fantastic one that I have from uh, from K, uh, K6ARK but uh, that that is the radio of choice. I do have a 100 watt radio which you see over here on the right hand side which is the Yaesu FT891. Fantastic radio. I carried it for over a year. 
it does weigh a lot more and you have to carry a much bigger battery. I do carry a battery for the um, KX2. It's a really small one. It allows me to do a whole bunch of activations with it and then keep the internal one as kind of a backup. So um, you have to carry a heavier one for the 100 watt radio, but again, uh, it depends on what your soda mission is. In some cases, I'll take the 891, for instance, uh, going up on Whale Peak with uh, K6ARK, spending the night, um, took a bunch of extra gear because there was a sideband contest going on, and that was a heck of a lot of fun to be up on a mountaintop with zero RF around us um, except each other and um, put some, some wire up in the air and just absolutely kill it from up there. You can get all kinds of great DX, something that I couldn't even come close to at my home station. Um, you throw an antenna up in the air and it's like a thousand, it, it feels like it's a thousand feet on a tower. So again, it, it depends on what your mission is and, and what equipment you're gonna carry. Um, so that's, that's a really good example. <coughs> antennas is another really big um, set of options it's an area where you know there's about a zillion different things that you could carry um, my top ones are the number one the K6 ARK um, antenna which you'll see in a minute um, absolutely love 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 that antenna it's, it's a has a little 9 to 1 unit on it and I can run from like uh, 10 meters through 80 sometimes you can't get it to tune up on 80 but um, you get the picture it's super lightweight it's like uh, made out of a thread that has some wire in it <laughs> two ounces so um, that's pretty awesome the the other th antennas that I carry typically have the LNR N fed in there which is now sold by Vibroplex by the way um, I have a carry the pack antenna for the 100 watt radio or a chameleon um, vertical antenna which weighs a lot more but it's super easy to set up and you can get it up and you can get it up quickly in high winds uh, which is one of the reasons why I bought it uh, and it's worked great I mean I've worked uh, New Zealand multiple times with it on 100 watts um, the KX2 I've worked New Zealand with the uh, K6 ARK antenna um, on CW multiple times so uh, it really just depends on what you're doing. If you're going to run sideband, obviously a bit harder to get out, but uh, uh, we'll go with that. The Slim Jim antenna, it's a roll-up J-pole. Um, highly recommend it. You don't have to activate with HF. Um, I've said that before. I'll say it again. You don't have to do it. Just carry an HT with an antenna on it, and you're good to go. Um, the roll-up J-pole will give you a little bit of extra range. Um, I was with another ham, uh, W6RWS on Stonewall yesterday and um, he was getting like three times the contacts that I was hearing on my HT with just a, a little uh, diamond whip on it. Um, we've gone over the bio you know, batteries. Um, I run ham uh, application called Hamlog on my phone. There's better applications for logging if you have an Android phone. Uh, VK Port Log is one of the better ones. Um, the Garmin InReach Satellite Comms Unit. Let me stop and talk about that for just a minute. Um, the first reason why I got that is my wife doesn't like me hiking alone and you shouldn't but again uh, we'll, we'll talk about safety in a bit but the Garmin inReach allows me to turn on tracking if I'm gonna be in a sketchy wilderness area um, I can turn that on if something happens to me at least my wife can come and find the dog um, so I've got tracking uh, which you can turn on uh, it does require a subscription uh, but uh, makes people a little bit happier if um, it also allows me to send SMS messages which is fun to send SMS messages to friends typically my cell phone does not work when I'm out in the mountains um, cell phones don't work I don't ever depend on a cell phone so the Garmin inReach allows me to send SMS which by the way allows me to spot myself which is the other reason why I bought it um, I don't have access to APRS a lot of people use that to spot themselves that works great in California, but not in Arizona. There weren't any APRS on ramps that I could get into uh, from some mountaintops there. So uh, another win for the Garmin. It's super light. You, it has Bluetooth, so you just throw it in the pack, and you can do everything you need from your phone, send messages, etc. 
Uh, you can also receive SMS messages from the people that you sent them to. Um, so that's cool. The larger one lets you do everything from the unit. Um, it also has a screen with, I think, a map on it. Um, I don't use it for any navigation, but it might give you it might give you a backup uh, uh, navigation. It uses the Iridium satellite network, which is getting has been getting upgraded with additional satellites. I'm not sure if that's improved uh, this particular unit's um, uh, time to bird, but uh, it's it's not a guarantee. You won't always have communications, but it gives you a heck of a lot better chance uh, if you do get hurt because they have. A SOS button on there which is the other reason why most hikers buy them uh, if they get hurt you can press the uh, Mayday button on there and it sends a message to a operation center which then looks at where you're at and notifies the appropriate agency so it is a unit that serves multiple uses and is a lot of fun to, to use as I said I'll send uh, SMS's to friends um, if you have another friend with a in reach unit, you can send uh, that operator a, uh, a, uh, a an email, all via the Iridium network. So pretty cool. Um, it's not a guarantee, but um, it certainly reduces risk. I put all this stuff in a, in a Gregory Zulu 40 backpack. Um, it's bigger than what I need. Um, I can get everything I need in there, plus uh, all my winter stuff. So it. it it does start to fill up because I throw a few extra layers, puffy jacket, etc., in the backpack um, for the winter, and um, so that comes in handy. Another kind of comment about the backpack is I have tried the military style. You know, once you get in sporting goods stores, they look really cool. The molly straps are super handy for attaching gear on the outside, but they're made for weekend warriors. Um, throwing a little lightweight jacket in the back and and uh, their lunch and that's about it. They are not designed to haul 30, 40 pounds. Um, when I'm fully, my full load out is about 29 pounds with a full load of water. I'll carry uh, more, way more water than I need for an expedition, and we'll talk about why. But it's it's held up for over two years. Um, I think the only rip I have is in a little external pocket that I. Um, caught on something so uh, where's the other ones have basically straps have broken and it's they've come completely apart so they look really rugged they are not um, the, the little military style ones the Gregory backpacks um, I can I can vouch for they're extremely well made there's other makers like Osprey's and, and other ones out there that are great backpacks my recommendation is on backpacks is you absolutely positively have to try them on um, if you just go and order them off of, you know, online, whatever, um, you're not guaranteed for failure, but by going down to a place like REI or somewhere else, having a whole bunch of weight put in it, wearing it, putting it on, having somebody help you choose the right size, putting it on, um, they all fit differently, guaranteed. I tried several backpacks um, loaded with... Uh, around 40 pounds and walked around the store for a while. I started on one of them just a little bit of rubbing that I was getting on my shoulder just because of the way the pack was made and the way it fit me and the response from the salesperson was okay after 10 12 miles you're you're really gonna be hating it um, because it feels like a little pinch now after 20 you know after wearing this thing all day you're gonna be hating life so um, by putting them on you're going to catch things like that. Um, so that's all I'll say about backpacks. I love the design of this one because you can get in from the top and the, um, and the side there. Um, I always carry an HT even if I'm not going to activate with it. Although I always try um, 14652 out here in California to see if I can get a contact or two. It's a national calling frequency. I always turn it on while I'm hiking and monitor 14652 as part of the wilderness protocol, which you should look up. Um, if a hiker has a radio that can transmit on 14652, it's recommended they go to that and they transmit every so often to see if they can't get help. Um, the other thing I do is I program it for the repeaters in the area of operation so that if I do need to reach out and get help or 
you know, for instance, my car gets stuck um, or I get hurt um, or I need someone to help me spot. Um, I've got access to the rest of the world. Again, I don't depend on my cell phone ever working, and which is a good idea if you're doing if you're hiking in Arizona or New Mexico. Um, we talked about the ASU uh, 100 watt radio. Um, little, just a couple words about clothing. I throw in at least one extra layer in the summer. I generally have a fleece and a um, shell in the backpack, so that really counts as two layers. Um, a lot of times I've come out on summits and gotten chilled down, needed to put on a beanie because it was cold, a cold front was moving through and the wind was blowing, so um, I was a heck of a lot more comfortable. Um, in the winter, I pack um, a couple more layers on top of that in the bag. I'll have a puffy jacket and I'll have some gloves and, and uh, certainly a beanie and stuff. Um, I use Soda Goat for the iPhone. It's a great little app uh, if you have an iPhone. Um, I think it works on Android, not sure. Use that to um, uh, spot yourself. You can see other folks that have been spotted on other summits, so you can do some chasing for some summit to summit points and have a ball. Um, obviously, it would need internet connection. All Trails Mapping App, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to the uh, Choose Your Path section of this uh, video set of videos. But um, I've tried a few of them. This is the one I chose. Um, I recommend you try CalTopo, All Trails, and Gaia are the, probably the three that um, I know about and might recommend. Um, I did try Gaia. Um, I just couldn't get it to work uh, in the way that I wanted. So I stuck with All Trails and I've invested a lot. I have all my maps stored in it, um, all my recordings. You can download apps <coughs> so you can use them for offline access. Uh, which comes in real handy and most of the mapping applications for hiking have that feature make sure you use it and of course the medical kit I'm going to touch on that in a minute um, if you remember at the beginning of the video uh, for this section I said there's multiple ways to do this uh, hobby here and let's let's take a look at that the other way to do it is to go ultralight and uh, go ultralight featherweight I call it with uh, CW by K6ARK so by learning CW, you can lose a lot of weight and get some great mileage uh, because you can just punch a lot farther on 5 watts with CW than you can sideband. Um, pictured in the upper left-hand corner are some of the radios that uh, K6ARK uh, Adam has built. They're really cool uh, um, radios, uh, HF radios, uh, built-in Altoids uh, tins. Uh, in fact, the one has gotten so small that he had to solder the earbud onto the PCB so that it, uh, uh, because he didn't have enough room for a jack. And then he generally puts uh, some little touch keyers on the outside of them so he can, uh, that's all he needs. He can just throw that in his back pocket and uh, some earbuds and an antenna, and he's good to go. And speaking of antennas, um, this is one of uh, K6ARK specialties. Um, there are about a million ways you can build your own, but he's built an NFED uh, multiband antenna with a little 9 to 1 unit on it, made out of some super lightweight um, um, uh, wire, and threw it on a winder. And what he found is it was, I don't know, a couple of grams heavier than he wanted, so he drilled holes in the winder. <laughs> so, very cool little setup there in the left hand corner. Um, my, the other piece of gear I want to point out is in the lower right hand corner which is a keyer uh, that K6 ARK built for me. It is a wine cork uh, keyer. It has a little jack in the back for the wire and um, I love it. It was the, the my first CW from a mountaintop was made using that keyer. Yes it takes both hands to hold on to. It's a little bit fiddly but it works great. I keep it in my backpack at work because we have a station at work that I can run over to and maybe do a little chasing at, at lunchtime. But uh, I still use it and, and it's ultra lightweight. So this is my uh, secondary keyer. Um, I, there is a picture of my keyer that I have on my website. So uh, let's jump over to that really quick. If you go to uh, hamninja.com or my call sign n1clc.com you'll end up here 
if you go to equipment loadout you'll see um, a little bit more detail on the gear that I'm carrying um, here is the two ounce uh, antenna that was built for me by K6ARK um, I've I've used this and contacted New Zealand three times with this thing with the KX2 um, via CW. This thing rocks. Um, so the whole station, including the keyer, as you can see here, uh, is was it two pounds seven ounces for the entire station without the push-up pole. So um, pretty pretty cool setup. So um, that is another way of doing summits on the air. So as I mentioned the next section is about how I choose and a path to the summit, uh, the tools that I use, uh, how I go at it, how I uh, keep track of um, on the, where I'm at on the on the trail etc. And uh, of course how to get out to the trailhead is, is uh, just the first step in that whole hiking part of it. But we're at the end of part one, so um, I'm going to leave you right here hanging on a thread. Uh, part two of the planning is going to be published here hopefully in the next week or so. And uh, we're going to go through all of that and more. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're going to talk more about getting there, uh, setting up, uh, spotting, you know, doing our thing, and uh, getting home safe. So uh, part of that will also cover a video of what I would call a reference activation, uh, kind of like reference architecture. So uh, a lot more to come. And uh, if you've watched the video up to this point, thank you very much. Uh, you might want to press subscribe and click on the little bell so that you know when the next video comes out. Talk to you guys later in 73.